So in Act 2 of A Midsummer Night's Dream, we finally get introduced to the fairy world. And these fairies seem to have a close relationship to the natural world. They are also mostly invisible to the characters who have entered the forest, even though these fairies can do quite a bit to manipulate the behavior of the people who have entered the forest. The fairies tell us that they have caused accidents, helped people leave their partners, and they have generally manipulated the world of humans for fun and entertainment. This, I think, is a bit allegorical. Like, the natural world often slips into the background of our lives, and we may not realize the invisible forces that impact our behavior and our fortunes. Part of what A Midsummer's Night's Dream explores is the impact of these invisible forces outside of our control, the way that the world around us shapes our identity and our fate. This is particularly true in Act 2, which we're going to investigate in detail, play by play, in this video. This is part of a larger series of videos on A Midsummer's Night's Dream, so if that seems like it's your kind of thing, please consider subscribing. And with that said, let's just dig into Act 2 of A Midsummer's Night's Dream. So Act 2 starts off in the fairy world, and now we have three distinct levels of action in this play. There is the world of Athens, which is overseen by Theseus, and it is the site of Hermia's tragic love plot. We have the world of the Mechanicals, which are the goofy theater troupe led by Peter Quince and where Nick Bottom and Snug are going to play their roles. And then we have the world of the Fairies, overseen by Oberon, and where Puck is going to play his little mischievous games. Straight away in this act, we are introduced to Robin Goodfellow, aka Puck one of Shakespeare's most famous characters. But before we move on to the exposition that Puck provides us in the scene, let's just consider the fact that these are fairies on the stage. Fairies on a plain, austere, wooden stage. Like, if we were watching this in the Elizabethan era, there would not be much on stage, and we're just asked to imagine fairies being there. And they're using their words to create an entire universe that is the fairy world. As the audience for this play, we willingly suspend our disbelief and let ourselves imagine the activities of these fairies. I want to call attention to this because our ability to imagine the fairy world is taken for granted by Shakespeare. And that is not something that Peter Quince and the Mechanicals take for granted at all. So it'll be an interesting point of comparison for the play within a play that happens later. But for now, Puck explains explains to his friend that the king of the fairy world, Oberon, is upset. He says that Tatiana, Oberon's partner, hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king, and that he is jealous of this, that he would have the child knight of his train. So Oberon's wife stole a child from an Indian king, and Oberon wants that child to be a knight in his entourage. And this conflict between the two will have big consequences in the play, so... I just want to pause and discuss that for a bit. Tatiana has a young Indian boy, and Oberon is jealous. Okay. Puck says that she stole the boy from a king, but that's not what she says. She says that the child's mother was a votress of my order, and in the spiced Indian air, by night full, often hath she gossiped by my side, and she would sail upon the land to fetch me trifles and return again as from a voyage rich with merchandise. But she, being mortal of that boy, did die, and for her sake do I rear up the boy, and for her sake I will not part with him. Tatiana is a fairy queen, and this boy's mother apparently prayed to her, was her loyal friend, and when the woman died, Tatiana became this boy's mother. That's a meaningfully different story than the one Oberon tells. From Oberon's perspective, a boy was stolen from a man, and another man should have possession of him so that he can become a knight. From Tatiana's perspective, a child lost his mother, and another mother needs to and has taken responsibility for that child. This is a gendered conflict as well as an argument about adolescence. Is this boy a man capable of entering a man's world, or is this boy a child who needs to be raised by a loving parent? And we should also make a quick note about the existence of this Indian boy in the text before we move on. It's quite possible that he never even appears on the stage. He has no lines. He exists merely as a plot device. So, like, why make him an Indian boy? Why not just have him be a changeling child, an adolescent with no further description? 
Personally, I tend to agree with the scholar Margot Hendricks that Shakespeare employs the racial identity of the boy as a further development of the cultural interactions that appear all over this play. Fairies, for example, interact with, oversee, and manipulate the humans, just as the noble ruling class of Athens interacts with, oversees, and manipulates the mechanicals who are going to perform that play. And in these interactions, different cultures and value systems interact with each other, notably with one having power over the other. Her essay on this topic is fantastic and deals with the pre-imperialist implications of racial ideologies in early modern travel literature and the ways that English travel writers characterized India as a location with the potential to be partitioned, classified, and exploited, which, yeah, I mean, that's like pretty much what's happening here between Oberon and Tatiana. That's like what they're fighting about, the classification and exploitation of this child. I'll put the citation information on the screen for that Margot Hendricks article and in the description for anybody interested in further reading. But for now, let's return to the implications of this argument between Oberon and Tatiana. Two fairies fighting over this Indian boy has caused bad weather on Earth, and that means poor crops. Corn is rotting, crows are eating all the dead animals, and all sorts of bad stuff. When the fairy world fights, there are environmental consequences. So in some ways, this play is a fertility myth, a myth about restoring the health of the environment. This disagreement needs to be reconciled so that the health of the natural world can be restored. We also learn through this argument between the two that Oberon likes to mess around with mortal women, and that he's been fond of Hippolyta. While at the same time, Theseus has long been a favorite of Tatiana, so they both care about the wedding that bookends this play. And after this fight, Tatiana leaves the stage and Oberon turns to Puck. He tells Puck that there's a flower once struck by Cupid's arrow, and that the juice of this flower, if laid on someone's eyes, will result in that person falling in love with the first person that they see. That's a pretty dramatic plot device. So Puck then leaves the stage to go search the world for this plant, and he says that it takes him about 40 minutes, but in the logic of the play it takes like, I don't know, three minutes, but those are an eventful three minutes. While Puck is gone, Oberon observes Demetrius arguing with Helena in the woods. Demetrius has gone to stop Hermia from running away with Lysander. And this argument that they're having, it's kind of interesting. Helena says some wild stuff in here. Like when Demetrius makes it clear that he doesn't want anything to do with her, she says, And even for that do I love you the more. I am your spaniel. And Demetrius, the more you beat me, I will fawn on you. Use me but as your spaniel. Spurn me, strike me, neglect me, lose me. Only give me leave, unworthy as I am, to follow you. Like when Demetrius threatens physical violence against her, she keeps following him. She says, do me mischief in the temple, the town, the field. I like can't believe that this is one of the most performed plays in schools. So in this scene, she is fully subordinating herself to him. She's asking him to treat her like a dog and like, what's up with that? Like what role does this have in the play? Well, let's compare this to other forms of domination in the play. Aegeus and Theseus want Hermia to be subordinated, to treat her father as a god, one that composed her beauties, yeah, and one to whom she is but a form in wax, by him imprinted, and within his power to leave the figure or disfigure it. But she doesn't behave that way. She refuses to be subordinated. Similarly, Oberon wants Tatiana to give up the boy. He wants to subordinate both her and the boy to his power, but she doesn't behave that way. Helena does. She's playing the part that masculine characters keep asking feminine characters to play. If the men in this play want the women to follow orders, well, Helena is giving them exactly what they want, but it seems that they don't actually want that. Now, it's easy to read this scene as just Helena giving up all her dignity, but I also think it's more complicated than that. When Demetrius says, I am sick when I do look on thee, Helena responds, and I am sick when I look not on you. And like two things about that. One, Helena is funny, she's quick and she's witty, and two, in some strange way, she's advocating that her own desires are equal to his. He thinks that his feelings about her should be reflected in the way that she behaves towards him, and she asserts that her feelings towards him should have that same force. He thinks his feelings matter more than hers. 
she says that they don't. In the previous act, Hermia said that Athens had become a hell when she fell in love with Lysander and yet couldn't be with him safely. Helena, in this scene, says that she's going to make a heaven of hell. If the patriarchy of the play is going to demand female subordination, then she is going to find a way to find pleasure in that subordination. She's going to fetishize her own submission. Helena is a deeply complicated character. As she leaves the stage, Puck returns with the flower and love potion. Oberon explains that he's going to put the love potion on Tatiana's eyes while she sleeps in the woods, which will make her fall in love with something when she wakes up, probably an animal, and he instructs Puck to put it over the eyes of Demetrius when he'll wake up near Helena. And this simple solution would solve all the problems of Act 1. Act 1 introduced a problem, you have two women and two men, both men desire the same woman. A simple solution here is to make Demetrius fall in love with Helena, and then this could be a comedy, it could end in marriages. So how do you solve this problem? Love potion. Easy. Oberon has it. But simple solutions rarely have simple results. It's going to be a lot more complicated before that can happen. And that's going to bring us to scene two. In scene two, Tatiana falls asleep and Oberon sneaks in to cover her eyes with the potion. His hope is that she'll fall in love with some beast and that he'll be able to use that as a distraction or as leverage in order to take the boy from her. At the same time, but on a different visual plane, Lysander and Hermia enter. Hermia says that she's found a good place for herself to sleep, but that Lysander should find somewhere else. She wants to keep such separation as may well be said becomes a virtuous bachelor and a maid. And I find this part super interesting. Hermia has, in some ways, thrown off the expectations of patriarchy by disobeying her father and running away into these woods with the man that she loves. And at the same time, she has romanticized her romantic love into some standardized version of love that still plays by a set of rules and demands modesty in women. She can throw off the chains of her father, but she remains chained to the expectation of her own sexual purity. She fears for her reputation, even though she fled the city and is far from the judgmental eyes of others. So she puts Lysander off to sleep somewhere else, and by this separation, he will be seduced by another. She pushes him away on her terms, but he'll be seduced away by forces beyond her control. So her caution here might be because of patriarchal normative influence. But there's another way to interpret her caution here. She might also be genuinely afraid of heterosexual intimacy. While she sleeps that night, she dreams that Lysander watches a snake eat out her heart with pleasure. So there are lots of ways to interpret her motivations here. She may just be afraid to take that next step with Lysander. Anyway, they sleep separately, and as I said in the Act 1 video, Demetrius and Lysander are essentially equivalent. So it's no wonder that Puck, who enters the scene looking for Demetrius, sees Lysander and mistakenly puts the love potion on his eyes at just the moment that Helena enters the scene. It's clear at this point that even though in Act 1 all the characters think that they have agency to cast themselves in certain roles, Hermia the star-crossed lover, Lysander the hero, Theseus the lawgiver, and so on, humans don't really have that kind of control. Puck, and the chaotic nature he represents, mess with human agency. The working class might put on a play for the upper class to watch, but the upper class is a big reality TV show for the fairies to watch, and they're choosing the parts for everyone. So all of those powerful characters, they exist in a larger context that influence and manipulates them as they seek to influence and manipulate others. As the scene goes on, Helena is losing energy in her pursuit of Demetrius and has come to believe that she is ugly. I'm going to return to Helena's character arc in the next video, but here, she notably decides to let Demetrius leave for a bit, and in that moment, she sees Lysander sleeping, and she wakes him up. As he awakes, he falls in love with her. That's what the love potion does. Because she's lost all her faith in her physical appearance, she actually thinks that she's being mocked. So she runs away, presumably to continue her pursuit of Demetrius, and Lysander pursues her. Hermia then wakes up alone and calls for Lysander, but not finding him, sets off to find him. So this scene ends, famously, with Demetrius chasing Hermia, Hermia chasing Lysander, Lysander chasing Helena, and Helena chasing Demetrius in a big circle, and that takes us to Act 3, which we will go through, play by play, in the next video. 
please subscribe to be notified when that video is released. Thank you for watching this one.